kids at the end of this morning's service, Godson and Sophie came to me and expressed to me, they said, we've been teaching a lot about baptism, we've been hearing the teaching, and we, we would like to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight for the remission of their sins. So tonight, we are so excited at the end of service. It's going to be like the crowning moment of a Labor Day weekend. It's going to be so exciting. I'm very grateful for how God is moving and working in our midst. And uh, I know that I am the only thing between you and the last summer holiday, Monday. However, I think one of the saddest scriptures in the Old Testament was the one that said, this is the rest wherewith the weary are called to rest, and this is the refreshing yet they would not hear. And I'm very interested in not duplicating the failure of the past, but actually taking advantage of what God has for us in the present. And all that really means is we've just got a little extra time, a little extra energy. We can give what we got to God. I don't know of a better way to start the week than the way we're starting it right now. I'm, I'm ready for God to continue to move. I'm ready for God to continue to touch. I'm ready for God to impart something into somebody's life and in somebody's heart so that by the end of service maybe you haven't taken a step of baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ but you said I'm ready to step in I'm ready to take that step of faith maybe you haven't had God minister move work the way that you like to see a move minister or work but by the end of service you can say you know what God met me Labor Day weekend Sunday So very, very thankful for everyone that's in the house of the Lord. And uh, I'm going to ask that we drop the center screen. We do have a <clears throat> uh, title slide for the message tonight. Um, the title of the message tonight is The Great Labor of Love. The Great Labor of Love. If you would turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14, Pastor and Sister Wilbert uh, had to take the Bernards back up. Uh, you, met, you heard him mention this morning, if you were in service, that we borrowed Brother and Sister Bernard for the morning service, and then uh, Pastor and Sister Wilbur took them back this afternoon for the evening service there tonight, and uh, we're just praying God's blessing on that conference and on our great superintendent. Wasn't that a phenomenal message this morning? Wasn't that just absolutely wonderful? And um, I'm, I'm so appreciative of the leadership that we have in our fellowship. I'm grateful to be part of a great organization called the United Pentecostal Church International. And Brother Bernard's not even here. So you know I'm saying that from my heart. It's going to be a great week, isn't it? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. Everyone say one. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now would you just take a moment and put your Bible down? And we know that speaking about Christ. And if you're grateful for the offering that he perfected and offered for us. Would you take a moment and just ask God to talk to us tonight over the next few moments that God's word would speak into our hearts and our life, that God would allow us to see what he did for us, that we would observe not just from the peripheral, but we would observe from internal the great labor of love that he did on our behalf. Father, we're so thankful for how we've already sensed your presence. God, people that came on purpose tonight into church. They came here to worship you. They came to gather together with people of like precious faith. But God, this isn't the end all and this isn't the be all of our week. This is the beginning. And God, you're gonna commission in this service. God, you're gonna transmit something into hearts and in lives that you need distributed, delivered, and given to the world that we get to live in. Father, I pray, God, that what has already been given in this God, in these services, God, in this church house today, God, it would continue in the next few moments in our lives, God, in this room, into our families, in our homes, God, into our workplaces, we give you great praise because you really are a great God, and I know we sang about it just a moment ago, but would you clap hands to the Lord for what he has in store, for what he's going to do in the next few moments? I mean, just really, really, really clap him. Man, and you may be seated. The origins of Labor Day can be traced back to April the 15th in 1872, and Canada even has a part in this. It was when the Toronto Trades Assembly organized Canada's first significant demonstration for workers' rights. 
The aim of the demonstration was to release the 24 leaders of the Toronto Typographical Union who were imprisoned for striking the campaign, now catch this, for a nine-hour workday. They were just trying to limit what was happening to nine hours a day. And at this time, trade unions were still illegal and striking was seen as criminal conspiracy to disrupt trade. And in spite of all this, the Toronto Trades Assembly was already a significant organization and encouraged workers to form trade unions, mediated disputes between employers and employees, and they also signaled the mistreatment of workers. There was an enormous, enor enormous public support for the parade that was happening, and the authorities could no longer deny the important role that the trade unions had to play in the emerging Canadian society. A few months later, a similar parade was organized in Ottawa and passed the House of Canada's first Prime Minister, Sir John Macdonald. Later in the day, he appeared before the gathering, and in that gathering moment, he promised to repel, repeal all of Canadian laws against trade unions. This happened in the same year, and eventually they let, this led to the founding of the Canadian Labour Congress in 1883. Labor Day then was originally celebrated in the spring, but after was later moved to the fall of 1894, and here we are in 2016 celebrating Labor Day. So Labor Day, as we understand it, Labor Day weekend, was the part of this challenge and call, the celebration of this weekend is given to the fact that people were able to create limitations on the expectation of labor, which for many of us, that's a good thing. I know that uh, when, I, <clears throat> when I was in school and in my early years of my working experience, I was, I was the guy called the laborer. Now, there were other guys that were called operators. They were the guys that were operating the great big heavy-duty machinery. And, but my job in the summers, and I was, I was blessed. I loved, I loved the fact that I had a good job, and, and it paid well. It got me through Bible school. And, and, uh, and so I, I was uh, grateful for the job, but I'd have to tell you that the guys that were running the equipment had an easier job than the guys that were running the shovel. And I remember there was one <clears throat> summer where the entire summer, all I did was operate the shovel. We were working in this, uh, this rock, well, it felt like a rock quarry. It was actually what would become the foundation of uh, Rossay Paper Mill in St. John West Side. And, and uh, so that was my responsibility. When the dynamite crew would go in and blast out all the rock, um, our responsibility was to go in and, and make sure all the debris was removed and all the rock was picked up. And, and a lot of that had to happen just by hand. The equipment couldn't get in there, couldn't move it around. They'd get the bulk of it out, but then we'd have to go in and with shovels and wheelbarrows and, and we just have to manually get that out. No wonder they called us laborers because the responsibility was to labor. And so I know that then or even now, if, uh, if my responsibility was to labor 12 or 14 hours a day at the end of a shovel, that would be a difficult day for Jack Lehman. Maybe not many of you, but I don't know if I can handle it anymore. And so this trade union, its job was to limit the responsibility of labor to nine hours a day. That's what we're celebrating on Labor Day. However, there are times in our lives when the sense of responsibility outweighs the request for rest in our lives. There are times in our lives when our work, if you want to call it that, becomes a labor of love. Where it goes beyond expectation, where the weight of the responsibility, we don't notice the time that we have to commit. We don't notice the time that has to get that has to be given. We, we're not kind of marking on the calendar and we're not putting it down in a day timer because there are times and seasons in our lives when our effort, our responsibility, what we're expending as individuals becomes a labor of love. Ministry is one of those opportunities where your heart can get tangled up in the lives of others and sometimes you help people navigate through difficult times and experiences. You lend advice, you offer support, engage in the challenge of fighting the devil, pray with faith, get in the word and study. Sometimes you get to be a leader and sometimes you get to be a teacher, but there are other times when you become the listener and the learner. And I would have to say that this is one of those seasons and one of those weeks for me and, and uh, in coming... <clears throat> into this weekend, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this message and, 
and, uh, and just about kind of the, what was the framework that kind of, what was the catalyst for speaking about what I want to speak about tonight? And, and I think really as, <clears throat> as I begin to study a little bit about this subject, I, I, I realized it was because of some of the great labor of love that I've observed in the last few weeks on the part of some of our families. Um, you know that we had Sister Coy's funeral this past week, and we've been lifting up Sister Peterson, and we've watched these families take such marvelous care of their mothers. We've, we've seen this in the past with others, and I'm not excluding anyone else in the work that they've done, but I would have to say that th these families have, have just done a remarkable job in what we would call a labor of love. It's not that they're getting paid for the time, trips, the concern that they have, the the time that they spend in the hospital, that's not what it, it's all about. It, it, it's about love that pushes and pulls and embraces you with the challenge of a labor of love. And love is a very powerful thing. And, and as a matter of fact, 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, or verse 10 says this, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That love for us. You see, God loves us so much. And some people say, uh, you know, the, the love of God is greater than the sin that's in my life. And that's absolutely true. But we have to look at that with the proper perspective. Because God loves us in spite of sin that may be in our lives. But he loves us too much to leave us in sin in our lives. God doesn't want to leave us there. So God is on, he, he is committed. He has a, he's on a purposed agenda to make sure that we don't stay locked and bound in sin. God has a plan for us to be, be picked up and, and turned around. And we know that sin is a universal challenge for every one of us. The psalmist said it like this, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Every single one of us has to deal with the sin issue in our life. Every single one of us has, to, ha, has the responsibility because if the wages of sin is death, and it is death, then we have got to escape from the wages of sin. Paul, he was a little bit more direct when he spoke to the church at Rome. He, he, he talked a little bit more about the human condition of sin. He said, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is in their list, lips, and whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. He said sin is a universal condition that plagues all of humanity. And the wages of sin is death. And so we need a way. We have to have an escape from the wages of sin in our lives. We've got to have an opportunity. Otherwise, we're all hopelessly lost. Otherwise, we all don't have the opportunity to experience the hope that Christ said was available for us if we don't deal with the sin issue in our life. However, Paul gave us this hope in his letter to Timothy. He told the church in Rome, this is what we are. This is the human condition. This is, this is what we all have to deal with. This is what sin does through us. This is what sin does to us. However, he also said to Timothy, he, he said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I'm telling you what, that in the midst of all this hopelessness, God said, I've got hope. In the midst of all this sin, he said, there's a way out of sin. There's this acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Aren't you glad for salvation? I mean, we, I, I couldn't help it. I, I don't remember hearing that song. Maybe we've sung it before. But uh, like one of our bass players used to say, I've never heard that song before in my life. We may have practiced it 25 times. I think the older I get, the, the less of a brain I have for music. So maybe, team, I'm sorry if we've sung that before. But it felt like, the, felt like it was, I was hearing that for the first time tonight. But God is a great God. 
We serve a great God and a God that is greater than our sin. You see, church, when we realize that sin is the greatest challenge that we have, when we realize that sin is the greatest opposition that we have, when we realize the terminal disease that sin puts in the spiritual life, then we have got to start looking for a way out. We have got to start looking for another answer. We have got to start looking for a solution. And if you really realize that hell is the place where sinners end up, then you realize the need for a way of escape and a way of hope in the midst of hopelessness. And, and Paul was telling Timothy, Jesus came to save sinners. And that is worth rejoicing about tonight. You see, the Old Testament model of redemption was based on works. You see, they knew that sin was the issue. They knew that sin was the problem. They knew sin uh, was this responsibility that they had that they couldn't take care of on their own. And, and so sacrifice became the way that they dealt with the sin issue in their life. And God created this opportunity. It was called the tabernacle. The tabernacle became... The one opportunity that God gave Israel to deal with the sin issue in their life. Hebrews 10 speaks about it for a few moments in chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance made of sin year after year. Verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me, and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. God didn't have pleasure in this responsibility that the priests had day after day. You see, their job was every single morning. They had this responsibility, this work that had to be accomplished, this work that had to be completed because sin was an everyday issue in Israel. And every day they had to deal with the sin issue. They had to make sure that the sacrifices were prepared. They had to make sure that it was properly offered, that the right offering came and, and it had to be inspected. It had to be gone completely over. It's this what is required. It had to line up with the rules and it had to line up with the responsibilities and the priesthood was just hard work that priest every morning he had a job to do he had to make sure that the sacrifices came he had to make sure that the fire the scripture said was ever burning on the altar and, and it wasn't like our stoves that we have now that you could kind of tighten everything down and get the air draft knocked down and I mean have you ever seen a real wood fire just burn you got to keep wood on top of that thing. you got to keep the fire going. It's a full-time responsibility to keep an open fire going. So the priests, they had to make sure that the fire was ever burning on the altar. They had to make sure that everything was prepared for the daily activities. The brazen labor had to have the water. It had to all be ready. It had to be prepared. And his daily responsibilities went from morning until night. And sacrifices were offered. And gifts were given and, and offerings were brought and, and the, this responsibility was just this daily work, this job, this great labor on the part of all the priests. Hebrews said that year after year, continually, that offering would be made. Continually, just a continual offering. You, you, you can kind of see the scope, the size of the field, the, the, this, uh, this, the, the oil had to be in the candelabra, the table of showbread had to be prepared, and, and once a year when that high priest entered into the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, everything, it was just this place of perfection that God had prepared so that people could offer sin sacrifices to take care of that sin issue in their life. This redemption model of the Old Testament was based on work. Works that were done to push sin ahead year after year, after year, after year, day after day, after day, after day, work. It was just a tremendous, phenomenal amount of work. And if you'll notice with me as we look at this model of the tabernacle, how all these things, this 
preparation, how God gave Moses very specific instructions. He told him what he wanted the tabernacle to look like. He told him what he wanted the tabernacle to be built like. He told him what the materials he wanted used, everything from the sockets that were, that were uh, used for the, the posts and, and the, 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 the specific material that was used, the colors of the material, how that the tabernacle was to be constructed and built, who was to do what in the tabernacle, all these responsibilities and all these requirements he, he laid out very specifically in the Old Testament for Moses. He was very articulate. He was very intricate, the requirements that were given. And, and uh, as you begin to look at all, these furniture, all this furniture for the tabernacle, if, if, you, if you realize the work and the responsibility that had to be done daily, then you begin to say, well, I think that there's, there's something missing here. Because I know that uh, like me, you, like a break now and then. Isn't it Kit Kat that made a whole ad campaign, you deserve a break? And we all like a break now and then. But if you'll notice, if you'll notice in the, in the tabernacle, there was no place for the priest to sit down. It was just work that had to be done. It was a work that had to be accomplished. And what God was saying is that the work to take care of sin is never completed. The work to take care of sin can never be fully remitted by the, lamb of, by, the by the blood of one lamb. It can't be remitted by the blood of one goat. One sacrifice isn't going to take care of the issue. It, it may push it ahead for one more year. It may take care of that certain issue contained in this moment. But it, it, it won't ever pay for the full price. And, and so the priest's job was never done. So morning to noon, and noon into evening, the morning sacrifices and the evening sacrifices, the responsibility to keep everything moving and flowing. Hebrews 10 verse 11 said, every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, he said, which can never take away sin. Those duties and responsibilities kept him busy, kept him working kept him moving, kept him going forward because the sin ha issue had to be taken care of. But here is the hope that we find. And on this Labor Day weekend, when we talk about limitation of labor, the real limitation of labor and the real celebration of the work that has ever been completed is the work that happened in Jesus Christ. Because if you read in Hebrews, here's this very simple message tonight. But you'll find in verse 12 it said, but this man, speaking of Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice forever, he sat down at the right hand of God. In other words, all the priests of all the years and all the past could never have the opportunity to be seated because their work was never done. The responsibility was always there for them. People were always sinning and sin always had to be taken care of. The sacrifice always had to be brought day after day after day. So there was no opportunity for them to sit down. However, when it came to the work of Christ and at the cross of Calvary, there was a price that was paid so that when Jesus was finished, the work was complete and the work was done. And the Bible says, the author of Hebrews said, I'll tell you what, there was no other priest in all of the past that ever had the opportunity to sit down. But when Jesus finished the work of Calvary and when Jesus paid the price for your sin and when his blood flowed down an old rugged Roman cross by the time that work was completed and that blood was offered in the heavenly tabernacle I tell you what the scripture says it said that he sat down and he sat down because the work was done and he sat down because the work was complete and it didn't matter what happened in your past it didn't matter how bad how wrong you were I tell you what Jesus said it's complete the blood is enough for that sin. He offered one sacrifice. He offered it one time and he sat down because it was enough. It was enough for every person that's ever lied. It was enough for every person that ever cheated. It was enough for every person that ever walked a wayward path. It was enough for every person that ever sinned. The work was enough. And in that moment, he sat down. I don't think I've ever celebrated about somebody sitting down. We 
we celebrate about great work that gets done. But I tell you, we need to pause for a moment tonight. And we need to thank God that the price was paid for every bit of our sin. And when he finished the work, the work was finished. It is finished. Was that moment he knew, I got the blood. I got the blood that will cover sin. I got the perfect sacrifice. Ah! He was the lion and he was the lamb. He was the prophet and he was the priest. But more than that, he was the perfect sacrifice for every single sin. And when that blood was offered up, that is the labor of love. You see, the great labor of love saw us where we are. The great labor of love said, I can't leave them the way that they are. I can't, I can't leave them in their sin. I've got to show them the way out. I'm sorry if I'm a little excited tonight. I'm sorry if I'm a little bit loud. But you see, in my own life, I know the power of the blood. In my own life, I know what the blood can do. I know that it's greater than every bit of sin. I know that whenever the enemy comes and he's brought his greatest challenge, he's brought his greatest threat, he's brought his greatest temptation, that all I have to do is plead the blood because it's sufficient. It's, he's abundantly able. When he finished that work, he sat down. He said, you know what? My blood is enough. I can complete the work. I, I can, with confidence, know that this offering, this sacrifice, this blood that he offered was enough for every bit of sin, for every bit of humanity, if they would just plead the blood. When a man's convicted of a crime, the judge determines his punishment. When the man has served that time or done the assigned work, he says, I've done my time. I paid my dues. There's no more punishment for me for that crime. But that's not the way it is with sin. You see, sin is relentless. Sin, the scripture we already read, brings death. Death is the proper penalty, but it's it's not a penance. It's not, it's not a payback. It's not like death equals sin because really death just takes you into this portal where we spend eternity living with the result of our sin. You've heard pastors say it. Sin, hell is how long we would have to suffer and be punished in order to pay for all of eternity for our own sin. Because sin exacts the price tag of death. But the promise that we, feign, that we found in Hebrews and the promise that we find throughout Scripture and especially at the cross is that he offered the perfect sacrifice for every bit of sin. Coming back to the music tonight. Paul wrote to Titus. He said, we're looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 14, watch this now who gave himself for us, that he might. Thank you, Brother Phillips. I was just checking to see if we're watching. Verse 13, let's try that one more time while the music team is assembled. Because I think that may, they may have got your attention. Looking for that blessed hope. And glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 14, together with me. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You see, Labor Day turns into a whole other category when we realize that we get to do some good works because the price has already been paid for the sin that has been committed at Calvary. He sat down because the work was completed. But then we get to inherit redemption. That's why we celebrate baptism around here. That's why we rejoice. My first words to God and Sophie this morning were, we are going to celebrate that with you. Because the blood is powerful. And this is a progressive step. They've already been baptized. They've already, they have a strong relationship with God. But there's something about calling the name of Jesus over a life when they're baptized. 
That's how scripture tells us to do it. We don't have any other instruction. And when we call his name, we're calling on that sacrifice that he made for us. And that is a moment for celebration. Because he paid the ultimate price for our sins. And when his work was finished, he could do what no other priest through all past ever had the opportunity to do. Not one of them in that tabernacle, not one of them ever had the opportunity to kick back and put their feet up and say, you know, the job was pretty good today. We did all right. 67 bullocks, 37 goats, 247 lambs. Man, that was a busy day. There was no collaboration. There was no sitting down in that tabernacle because their work wasn't done. But I tell you what, when Christ completed the work, he sat down at the throne as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He done the work that no one else could do so he could sit like no one else had ever sat. He was able to sit down because his work was complete. For every single one of us, the labor of love looks past all of effort and sees the result. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. I just have two more portions of scripture. Yet, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That labor, that effort, that work came from a position of pleasure on, the, on behalf of God. And, and he said, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. And when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Isaiah also said in chapter 53, verse 4, he said, Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But here's where the labor of love comes in. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Great healing. He ministers to every part of humanity. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Why didn't he stop? Why didn't he call 10,000 angels? I'll tell you why. It was a labor of love. He set his face like a flint. He walked with purpose, step after step. Didn't falter, didn't fall back. He walked toward the cross with great intention. Why? Because it was a labor of love. Could you stand together with me tonight for closing? Scripture says, He bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. When his work was finished, he sat down. I know we're celebrating Labor Day weekend this weekend, but there's a work that God wants to do in somebody's life, in somebody's heart. He's not putting limitations and restrictions on who he saves. Well, if you've got this number of sin and you've only sinned for this number of years, then we'll let you in. No, no, no. That's not how this works. He said that that sacrifice was sufficient and complete for sin. He lumped it all into one category completely and absolutely. And he said, this price that I'm paying, this blood that I'm shedding, this perfect sacrifice is enough for sin. You see, sin is that universal condition Paul mentioned. It's interesting that he's writing to Timothy. He's writing to the church in Rome. And he speaks openly about challenges. Why? Because sin can creep into any life at any time. 
That's why we need to keep, stay close to the cross. I feel the presence of the Lord here right now. I think God is working already. You could be someone, this may be your first time in this room and we are rejoicing that you are here. But you may have relationship with God, but you need a trip to the cross. Tonight. You, need, you need a reminder. You need to plead the blood of Calvary over your own life. Would you bow your head? I feel the presence of the Lord so powerful right now. right time just to call in the name of the Lord. There's salvation available for someone here this evening. There's a touch of God in this room right now. If you just lift your hands, the Lord wants to meet you right where you are. Holy Ghost, move in this room. restoration. God, you want to do a work of directing them into a place of salvation. Lord, I pray for someone who hasn't been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ tonight. I pray that they would feel that challenge in their spirit. God, I pray for someone that hasn't received the gift of your Holy Ghost, but the evidence is speaking in other tongues. As the Spirit gives them utterance, Lord, I pray that there would be an infilling in lives tonight in this room. Lord, I pray for the church. God, we know all this, the tactics of the enemy. We know how he can sneak in. And God, bring division between someone's heart and you. Lord, I'm praying tonight that someone would do the work that they need to do coming back to you. God, the work of repentance in their life. That's it. There's a spirit of prayer resting on this room right now. You just lift your voice. going to begin to sing in just a moment. I'm going to invite the entire congregation to come forward. We do that because it's an action on your part that shows intention. And God, I, I want to turn my life around. I want to live for you. And that intention can be in the heart of someone that served God for 60 years or someone that's served God for six minutes. But it's a place, we call this the altar because it's a place where, like in the Old Testament, the priest would lay the sacrifice down. Of course, we know, we already preached about it. It was a sacrifice that came back year after year, day after day. Tonight, I think God is looking for someone that will lay something on the altar and tell the Lord, I'm giving this up, I'm turning around, I'm giving you everything I got. It's a moment of clarity. It's a moment. Of, it's a, it's a declaration. I'm not saying we're going to physically lay anything on the altar, but in your mind, in your spirit, when you come to the front, it's about dedication. It's about submission. It's about giving God your life, your purpose, your plan, your will.
and you want to see what God can do with a life like that. Miracles happen in moments like that. Change happens in moments like that. We're going to sing one more time. There's a wonderful spirit of prayer. I don't want to deter us from any of that, but would you bring that same worship, that same prayer that you had just a moment ago, would you bring that to the altar because there's some folks here in this room that you're wanting to lay some things down, you're wanting to put some things on the altar and give it to God and I tell you what, the blood that you plead in your life that blood of Calvary is sufficient for everything that we're bringing to this altar tonight, everyone everything, we just need to bring it, are you ready to come? as we begin to sing, I'm going to invite everybody just come up close because we need the whole congregation in the altar I surrender.